It's time to go into business for yourself. Get ready for another episode of the Franchise Academy Podcast. Education, insight, and inspiration. Here's your host, small business and franchise expert, Tom Scarda. Welcome to another episode of the Franchise Academy Podcast. My name is Tom Scarda, and we are everything franchising, everything you ever wanted to know. We hopefully will have it for you here in one of our episodes. So I'm actually a franchise consultant. I work with people around the country, helping them figure out if franchising is for them or not. You know, it's not for everyone. I've owned and operated my own franchises, and I was usually hugely successful in my first franchise. My second franchise, I failed miserably, but that's what made me a franchise expert. Ended up writing a book called Franchise Savvy, which tells my story and teaches how to make not make the mistakes that I made. So um, I help people get into the right thing and, and not blow it for silly reasons. I'm really excited for this episode. So I have somebody who I've been pursuing for a while and been watching for a while, uh, Rebecca Monet, who is the chief scientist for Zoracle. So um, I got information here, so I don't want to screw this up. So Rebecca is the CEO and chief scientist for Zoracle Profiles. And Rebecca has been in the franchise consulting and psychometric assessment business since 1993, not to date her at all, but she is well known for her uncanny ability to draw performance correlations out of people and their personalities. Uh, she is really fascinated with neurology and neuro neuroeconomics. Ooh, my That's goodness. a big word. Huh? <laughs> there we go. And, and so I need you to help me understand what that means, but what this is is kind of profiling like you might have heard of disc uh profiling this is like that kind of but not at all <laughs> so so rebecca welcome oh i'm so excited to be here with you tom yeah this is so great um and we've met over the years through different franchise you know ifa conventions and i remember um actually seeing you do a presentation at uh, Harold Kestenbaum, the attorney uh, in New York. Oh, yes, in Long Beach. Yeah. I mean, uh, Long Island, excuse in, me, yes. Long Island, yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, so you're, and you're in San Diego, which is quite the opposite side of the continent. Um, but I'm excited to have you. So tell me about Zoracle. I mean, how did, how, it's amazing to me what you guys do. So give me a little synopsis of what you guys do. So uh, Zoracle works specifically in the franchise space. We help franchisors and franchise consultants uh, facilitate a right fit between a prospective franchisee and a franchise uh, system. We do that using psychographics. So we use a uh, meta-analysis approach to take a deep look into the hearts and minds of prospective franchisees. So we don't just look at personality, we look at the values of that individual. We look at the kind of culture that a prospective franchisee might fit in. We measure their, their skills and their competencies so we can leverage that uh, within a franchise uh, business. We look at what stage of growth of a franchise organization uh, they're going to fit in uh, best. So everything we do is focused on having that prospective franchisee fit well and ultimately do well in a franchise system. And that's what the franchisor wants. That's what the prospective franchisee wants. We simply use seven statistically validated sciences, an unbiased approach to looking at someone and then looking at where they might be a good fit in terms of uh, being a franchisee owner. Huh. That, it's, it's amazing. And it's so really nothing like disc profiling at all, but my own personal experience, you know, I was, a, I was a subway conductor in the New York City subway system, opening and closing doors on the train and making announcements. Um, and I ended up buying a franchise back in 2000, something called Maui Waui Smoothies. Oh, yeah. And um, I dove into that, built it into three locations, sold it within five years for a really handsome amount of money and essentially semi-retired at 41 years old. And... After that, I, I took a disc profile test and the disc said, whatever you do, don't go into business. Don't be a salesperson. <laughs> um, but meanwhile, I was usually successful 
as a business owner. So where's the disconnect? Oh, and that's why we call it the disc, right? It's a disconnect. But <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Uh, you know what? I love the disc if it's used in an appropriate way. A personality test is designed to measure those things that are consistent through our lifetime. Now, I personally believe people change. I pe- believe people evolve. And what's important to them at 20 is not what's important to them at 50. And our skills and our personalities also evolve. But a personality test, which is what a DISC uh, uh, tool is, it's, a, it's measuring those things that stay consistent. It was originally designed strictly for communication, team building, conflict management. It is not designed to predict where you're going to be successful. In fact, it's been proven again and again to your point. They used to say if you were a high I, a high influencer, right, you would be this phenomenal salesperson. Well, statistics show that that is not true at all. It just means you're gregarious and you're you're persuasive. It doesn't mean you can close a deal and get a check, right? Uh-huh. It simply means uh, you love people and you're persuasive. In fact, statistics show that um, the better salespeople are folks that are slightly introverted, just slightly introverted because they come across as more authentic, more genuine, more trustworthy. So especially if you're selling a high ticket kind of item, to have this high eye or this extroversion that normally would be associated to sales is a detriment uh, rather than a positive when you're talking about uh, sales. So if it's used for what it's designed for, it works, but I think uh, people have expanded it trying to say, oh, that would make him a great scientist, so that would make him a great salesperson right. or whatever, and it's not, right. it's not what it was designed for initially. That's so interesting, because I am um, a, situa- a si- situational extrovert. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm the kind of person that could sit next to you on a plane from New York to California, say hello, and that's it. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you engage me in a conversation, I'll talk and... And yeah, I guess more, um, you know, more real. I just, I'm not, you know, I'm never trying to sell anything. I'm trying to, you know, my, my mission is to teach. That's, I'm a teacher at heart. So maybe that's where that all fits in. That's, it is. And, and that's, I, I like how you described it as a situational extrovert which shows that we are not hardwired, right? That you can step into a role and adapt and come across as, you know, an extrovert. But what we really are is more of a connector, more of a thinker, more of someone that ponders things. And you have a desire to edify and empower others. And so that's what comes across. And if you get too extroverted, people are not going to, hear that side or see that side of you that really does care about others you're not there to be seen you're not the life of the party can you be absolutely but that's not your uh, overall intention that's yeah well said that describes me (laughs) that's interesting um you know me already i feel like you have x-ray vision it's weird Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) so great um so how did you pick franchising for this i mean were you in franchising and then figured this out or vice versa how did that happen oh i was an accidental uh uh, in terms of entrepreneur and also going to franchising so i was a therapist and i uh worked with business owners only today we would call me a coach but back then we called us ourselves therapists so we worked with business owners to look at the gray matter between their ears to see what it is that was preventing uh, business owners from being as successful as they wanted to be so I was a therapist for many years and that took me into um, another world uh, simply because one of my clients said Rebecca the things that you're teaching me one-to-one can you do it for bigger groups and I said I don't know let's try it So he put together uh, about 300 people in a room, all business owners, and it was the first time I spoke in public, and it was like, you know, it was like duck to water. I was just like totally at home in that place. And that took me on another career, which uh, was as a trainer, 
uh, where it's teaching some of these skills to business owners, how to build their business, but from inside versus from a tactical outside operational uh, perspective. And then one day, uh, my kids, I was a single mama, and my kids were teenagers, and my travel uh, was an in, a lot of international travel. It was just getting too much. And so I went to bed, and I said, God, <laughs> I can't keep doing this. I need to be closer at home, especially to keep my eyes on my 16-year-old daughter. <laughs> <laughs> you can relate, right? And so I just went to bed, and I said, God, I need, I need another way, Right. And so I woke up with two words. This was uh, 1992, 1993, and I'd already been in psychographics for a number of years up to that point, but not franchising. I went to bed and woke up with two words, business broker. Now, I didn't know what a business broker was, uh, so I went to the refrigerator, got the yellow pages from on top of the refrigerator, opened it up, looked up business broker, no internet in those days, And there was four business brokers, and one of which was Howie Basick, who founded uh, FranNet. Back then, it was called Franchise Network. And I called all four of those uh, brokers, and I said, you don't know me, but God told me to call you. (laughs) And and I offered my services. I said, you don't have to pay me. Just just, I want to know what you're doing. So obviously, three of the four thought I was nuts, which I probably was slightly at that time, and with the exception of Howie Basick. And he said, free labor? Come on down. So he introduced me to the world of franchising. Um, So I studied everything that he was doing because I study people. I study patterns. I study puzzles. And I'm like, how is it this kind of funky guy? I don't know if you've met Howie Howie Basick. I love the man. I'm like, how is he selling these big deals? And he's just quirky and odd. And what what is going on? So I really wanted to study him and also help him find a way where he could replicate his consulting methodologies through other franchise uh, brokers. So he allowed me to observe him, document things, measure things, and begin to use psychographics and training in psychographics to help franchise brokers grow their business and also to better understand prospective franchisees. So Howie is my introduction into franchising and... I loved it. I just, I loved it uh, because my scientific mind is going, oh, shoot, this is so exciting because up until that point, you're measuring psychographic markers in someone in a vacuum, right? Who is this person in a vacuum? And now I had an opportunity to measure someone within a system. So you got a franchise system that's evolving and changing. I can measure that and I can do some predictive modeling, and I can measure the franchisee in comparison to that. That had never been done up until that uh, point. So now we had sciences that could be used within something called a system. So that, of course, was kind of my wheelhouse and something that I totally loved, and I was like, a godsend, right? I just uh, was thrilled to be introduced to franchising, and here I am still what is it, 27 years later. Wow, that's a fascinating story. I didn't realize that was the background for you. That's Mm -hmm. very cool. I'm so glad I asked that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What is it about human behavior that that fascinates you? Oh, people are fascinating. They're like, to me, they're like puzzles, right? But not just puzzles. They're like puzzle pieces all pulled apart, stuck inside a Ziploc bag and shook up. And then you don't have the box, right? You don't have the box that says, okay, this is a cathedral we're building or some kind of snow scene. This is just a bunch of pieces that you got to take out and start putting together. And all of a sudden you end up with a picture of who that individual is. So to me, humans are puzzles, but, um, more fascinating to me is there are patterns within humans. And if we can discover what those patterns are, we can quickly predict how they're going to behave in various scenarios or under certain types of pressure. 
So I'm always looking at what's the big picture? Who's this individual? Because I love puzzles. And I'm also looking at what are the patterns because then I can take that person and know that in this scenario, this is the behavior and this is the performance that they're going to uh, they're going to experience. So to me, it's just a it's a second science project, right? <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's very very cool. And so, how does this help? Um, you typically work with franchise companies or franchise consultants. How, how does it help a franchise company? I mean, how, could they really plug in, like, here's our personality profile and figure out the person if they take the, you know, do you have like a Zorical test or something that somebody takes? Exactly. So with franchisors, uh, what we do is we sit down with the leadership team and set some standards and benchmarks in place. So a franchisor will tell us, uh, we want franchisees that meet these certain standards. It could be annual revenue or profitability, market share, or it could be as simple as they pay their royalties on time. Uh, they are easy to get along with, they mentor others. So we set some standards in place and then we assess all of their franchisees using the seven sciences that I mentioned a little bit uh, earlier. And then from that data, the franchisor helps us separate those franchisees. We call the high performers, what we call group A, uh, are franchisees that are high performers and they're compatible and they meet all of the standards that the franchisor has set. And then group B are the mid performers, you know, they largely meet the criteria and the standards, but maybe they could perform better or maybe they're not as motivated or maybe they're not embracing our systems as well as we would like. And then group C are those low performers, those that just some reason or another are just not syncing up. They're not comfortable in our system. We're not comfortable with them. They're not performing. They're not retaining. There's some issues uh, there. So once we have all of that data and we've separated them into categories, then our, my job is to delineate the psychographic markers that are similar across the board, because that will tell me about the culture, it'll tell me about the brand, it'll tell me about mm -hmm. the value package. But what is also different about the A players versus the B players versus the C players. And then from there, uh, we deliver what's called a spot on uh, blueprint. And then we write a set of algorithms into the software where a prospective franchisee gets compared to the high performer. So the franchisor gets a report back, we call it the spot on eclipse. Eclipse meaning they're eclipsed against, the prospect is eclipsed against the uh, high performers. And it right. gives the franchisor uh, hard data that says this candidate from a values perspective is a 92%. From a stage of growth perspective is a 78%. From a, um, stage of, uh, from a cultural perspective, not a good fit. He's a 63%. So we give them the, the data so they can then make informed decisions that says, oh, this is a candidate I really, really want, or this is a candidate that if we bring them on, here's some gaps, we're going to have to uh, you know, add some training or add some support, or it could be uh, a conversation happens with that franchisee, well, here are the gaps, and maybe you want to bring on a partner or make sure you hire people that can fill in those kinds of gaps. So that's the process that we do with, with franchisors. Well, that's, that's amazing. So, so what you're kind of saying, what you're alluding to is that if somebody has the money, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be awarded a franchise. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what we're saying. <laughs> Imagine that. Right. <laughs> right. And, and it's so funny because that's a, a big myth that I like to bust regarding franchising is, is that people feel like, oh, you know, they're just going to sell me a franchise and, and feed me to the wolves. And, and there are franchises that will do that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are real serious. I mean, you're working with how many franchise companies now? So I have about 300 franchisors uh, that, that we work with. And you're right. Uh, the good franchises, the one that are uh, operating from a place of uh, wanting to do what is right and best by their franchisees, are going to take the time to get to know that prospective franchisee to make sure they have what it takes. Uh, it's not just about that initial fee. They know that they want a franchisee that 
that's going to protect the brand equity, that's going to retain, that's going to validate well. And that means they want franchisees that fit and also are going to perform well. It's a, it's good for everyone. To me, that's that's how a business should be run. It needs to be from a place of integrity. And, and franchisors are becoming more and more uh, aware that it, uh, not every monkey can can do this. Even if I have the best system, it still may be a, a franchisee that's not a good fit within my franchise system. Well, it's funny because people ask me all the time, you know, why do some people do well and other people do not in, in a particular franchise? And it's a really interesting bell curve, as you know, where, you know, 20% are top performance, 60% are average, and 20% are doing poorly. And for me, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but I think a lot of it has to do plainly with attitude, right? Yeah. If you if you get into a business and, and you're looking for all the reasons why it's going to fail, that's what you're concentrating on, and then that's what you might, might result in. Um, and, and it's hard to explain that to somebody. Yeah. Um, but would you agree? Is, is there a lot of attitude that's involved? You know what? Uh, I agree. I think some of it is about fit, Right, because like you said, you were crazy successful in one system, not so successful in another. Same person, right? You clearly had what it took to be successful. You had the raw material, the drive, the skills, all of those kinds of things. But something was not a good fit. You learn from it. So I think some of it's fit, and some of it, like you said, is attitude. We call it emotional and social intelligence. We happen to use the logic and the the science with uh, Dr. Daniel uh, Goldman's work. And these are softer markers. So if you're only measuring personality, you're only measuring uh, core competencies, you're not going to get these. These are softer markers, things like ability to build a team, conflict uh, management, influence, uh, decision-making skills, empathy, authenticity, uh, achievement drive. These are softer markers that don't show up unless you're specifically testing for them because people can interview perfectly right you've seen it they, they can be up you know they could be that situational extrovert they can have something in their head that they interview well and then you place them in the business and they snap back to who they really are and that's not going to show up unless right unless you have a very good process for interviewing that individual, uh, putting them in certain situations, and of course, using unbiased scientific testing. <laughs> Amazing. It's almost like, um, it's almost like dating in a way where people always put on their best on the first date, right? And then mm -hmm. it falls apart <laughs> later on a lot of times. I like uh, that analogy. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what trends are you seeing now in franchise recruitment? So it's interesting. Uh, we've been observing numbers for, for years now. And there's a couple of trends that I've noticed the last probably like eight years that are actually uh, concerning me uh, with franchise, franchise uh, recruitment. And this isn't that uh, franchise recruiters are bad. I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm saying that our market has changed a, a little bit. So some of the trends that I am seeing um, is the incoming franchisee is scoring lower in markers like initiative and in markers like empathy and in markers like transparency. Now we can blame that on a social media world, right? Where we're uh, more puffed up, we're not as authentic or transparent as we maybe were 10, 15, 20 years uh, ago. We can blame uh, this lack of initiative um, also on societal norms that have changed. Um, you know, younger generations who receive rewards without having to put in effort, right? Uh, participation awards rather than uh, truly knowing how to compete and truly knowing how to go up against obstacles. So these markers around grit and tenacity and initiative, we are seeing slowly slip, right? We're slowly starting to see these things uh, slip. 
And I think we're going to have some problems with that as recruiters, as uh, franchise consultants, as brokers, is that these franchisees that are coming in that lack this initiative, they lack this grit, they lack the transparency and the trustworthiness that maybe we had before, is going to start to show up as uh, negative on the books financially at some point for the franchisor and, of course, for the franchisee. Uh, coming in. It's also potentially going to take an audience that was large and narrow it down to a smaller number of potential candidates that will meet the standards that the franchisor uh, needs. They need someone who hunts, right? They need someone who can take initiative. And if we have a a group of people coming in that aren't capable of that, that's going to be a challenge. Absolutely. And we could do a whole podcast just on that subject matter for sure. (laughs) <laughs> um, amazing, amazing insight. So in, in your opinion, what are key elements that do make somebody successful in a business? So I think there's a fit is always number one, right? It's always number one. Uh, if somebody fits into uh, a franchisor's culture, so you have to know what that culture uh, is. Does someone fit where that franchisor is and the evolution that they're going through. Some of us thrive in dynamic early stage franchise systems. Some of us do much better when it's more buttoned down and plug and play. So do they fit in the stage of growth? Do they share the values of that franchise system? This is going to create a harmony. It's going to create long-term relationships. It's going to cause people to validate better and, of course, perform Uh, better. And then, of course, they need to possess um, the skills to grow the business. So, I always say uh, competency plus compatibility equals performance. So, you can have someone who is compatible, right? And then what you have is kumbaya. We get along, we're coming out, you know, we're all friends. I'm going to pay my royalties. I'm going to come to your conferences, but I'm not performing. I call it kumbaya. So we're compatible, but I'm not performing. But you can also have people who have the the skills, uh, the competencies and the soft skills to grow incredible businesses, but they're not a good fit. They won't embrace your systems. Uh, they don't mentor others. They speak negatively about the franchisor. So, and they end up being prima donnas and lone wolves and, and even renegades some, sometimes. So you've got to have both. You've got to have that they fit, they're compatible, and they have to have the, the skills. To me, those are the markers that will let us know if somebody's going to be a um, a superstar in a franchise system. And as you know, it's different from franchise system to franchise system. What makes someone successful in this system is not what makes somebody successful in another system. Every franchisor is unique. Yeah. Yeah, that well said. And I, and I think, you know, what you're calling these, these soft skills or these sort of soft personality traits are really probably the most important things as opposed to the hard ones. That's what really, I think, drive mm-hmm. somebody to success is having the tenacity, having, you know, having that attitude that when things, you know, you have a bad day or a bad week, you know, you're not in the back, you know, ready to commit suicide, but you know, <laughs> you're looking for solutions. Um, exactly. So and that's what I, makes a great business owner. I, I 100% agree with you. It is those soft skills that will ultimately determine if someone is going to be successful. The financial correlations between things like empathy or influence or or being a change catalyst, all of these markers have massive financial correlations. One point difference in any of these markers is anywhere from $60,000 to $100,000 a year in income for that franchisee. So if you're low, even in one of those markers, like the ones you just talked about, tenacity is a great example, initiative, empathy, even one point off can change the amount of dollars you're going to make. So I, I agree. This is, this is kind of the pivoting point uh, to success is when you have those soft skills. Absolutely amazing. So what would you say to somebody who's thinking about buying a franchise right now? Any advice for somebody in that category? I always recommend that they align with a good franchise broker, franchise consultant. 
uh, that can walk them through the, the, the process that is truly unbiased, doesn't care what business you buy, wants to do what's right and best uh, by you and by the franchise or don't go it alone. Get a good franchise consultant to come walk along with you. You can bounce things off. They can make introductions. They can help you screen through all of these opportunities. Otherwise, you're just going to waste your time. And obviously, uh, the second piece of advice is know thyself, right? Know mm-hmm. thyself and, and who you truly are. Uh, and then look at what that is in relationship to the franchises that you're looking at. And of course, we always recommend a tool to help you with that. But bottom line, some self-reflection, some self-assessment is going to go a long way. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, obviously, as a franchise consultant, um, you know, I used a franchise consultant for my first franchise, and she matched me to the smoothie thing, and it was just a grand success my second one i did it on my own i was like i was cocky i just you know i did so great i don't need anybody and i failed and and it's so amazing as i think back about it now i mean i was you know 15 years ago um like wow man did i miss so much just picking the franchise um running the franchise you know running a good franchise has nothing to do with how to pick a good franchise (laughs) I, I like that you discern the difference there. So, exactly. You were the same person, but now with a whole lot of success under your belt, probably your skill sets had gone up dramatically. So, this was not an issue of you couldn't do it. This was an issue of fit from the sounds of it and mm-hmm. not having a good process in place to help you discern if this was the right business for you. Right, because what happens... And, you know, for a lot of people and what happened to us in that second franchise is we became infatuated with the concept. Mm. And when you become infatuated with the concept, you don't, you don't think straight. <laughs> so like It's like love, right? Love is blind. Love is blind. <laughs> that's it. And, love and is that's blind. How, we don't see. Right. And, and that's how people often screw up things when they're picking a business. You know, when, when somebody's, when I, recently somebody opened up a smoothie franchise in my area and so I went in and I was talking to the owner and it was a it was a it was a franchise and I said I didn't say who I was but I said oh, you know why'd you pick this franchise and and the lady said we love smoothies every one of my family loves smoothies and I was like oh no well, that was that. a bad answer <laughs> and, and I and I said to my wife I bet in about I don't know, a year, they're probably going to be out of business. And, and it didn't even take that long, unfortunately. It was only like eight months and they were out. Mm, and that's sad. That's what so we sad. want to avoid, right? This is where you put your heart, your soul, your pride, your money, uh, your time into something. Nothing wrong with the business. Nothing wrong with that person. But this was a decision based on a limited amount of information. Passion should never lead right? Passion and love can be very blind. Uh, So you have to find something that's a good fit for you. Yeah. I mean, there's no question. When I had my smoothie franchise, I had friends who uh, went and bought the same franchise and they were doing it in a different area than me. And they just really saw my success. They didn't really research it. They didn't really think about what the day in life was going to be. And, you know, they saw me in a Hawaiian shirt making smoothies and, ah, oh, this was great. And it was a lot of fun. They did not see me at five in the morning on a Sunday going to the produce place to, to pick up bananas. Mm. And then when it came time for them to do that, they didn't do it because mm-hmm. they didn't have that personality. They didn't have that drive. I had a drive for whatever, <laughs> you know. So you have two people. Same demographic, same background, socioeconomics. I mean, everything is the same. One's franchisee of the year, and the other one fails. Right. But both wanted to wear a Hawaiian shirt. Right, right. <laughs> but you don't need to buy a franchise to get a Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> That's true. Somebody should have told them that. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes, they could have just went to like TJ Maxx and bought one. Absolutely. <laughs> Forget all the rest of the stuff that getting up at 4 a.m. to get bananas. Uh-uh. Forget it. <laughs> it was great. I miss those days, though. It was good stuff. I loved it. Um, so, not to change the subject, but just um, 
I, you know, you're very, uh, you're very smart. Um, you have a lot of education behind you. But I'm just curious, what are you reading these days? Any, any cool, insightful books you could recommend? Oh, uh, see, I'm always studying habits. And there is a book that came out a few years ago called Habits, right? And habits, I think, are uh, so important for a lot of reasons. One, the minute you take something to a habit, especially if it's something that will lead towards success, the minute you take it to habit, the brain no longer has to process it or think about it or discipline around it. It is a habit. You're going to get up. You're going to brush your teeth. You're going to do whatever. So whatever this habit is, if it's a successful uh, pattern that will lead you towards a certain outcome that you want, I think that's powerful. So to me, it's all about patterns. It's all about puzzles. So to me, uh, the, the book called Habits, I think is powerful because it teaches us how to deliberately create those habits. So then one day we wake up and we don't even have to think about it. We can now just be on automatic pilot and our brains can be freed to do uh, problem solving, creativity, whatever else it's designed uh, to do. But we don't have to do these following things because we're going to automatically do those. That's so wonderful. I love that. And I, I wish I could form some good habits um, <laughs> to lead to success. But um, I don't no, think this you is already have, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, I feel like I always got to do the next thing. I'm always ready for something new. Another challenge. More challenges. But I want to thank you for being on the podcast. Um, how could people find out more about you and Zoracle and what? So obviously, uh, directly through the website, zoracleprofiles.com, or find me on LinkedIn, Rebecca Monet on LinkedIn. Love to hear from you guys. Yeah, Rebecca, M-O-N-E-T, Monet. Um, and really appreciate all you're doing for franchises and franchisees, franchisors, and the franchise industry in general. Really appreciate it. I love what I do. I was just figuring out the other day, Tom, how many uh, franchise franchisees have gone in business since we started this, and it's well over 20,000 folks who have gone in business using brokers, consultants like yourself to help them find the right business. And so it's, it gives me great joy to see the success of those franchisees. Amazing. That's amazing. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So all your information, all Rebecca's information will be on the franchiseacademy.com. So check that out. And, and Rebecca, you have a podcast too. You call your co-hosting. So, yeah, so we're uh, just launched a new podcast called where passion and purpose collide. Uh, it's every Wednesday. It's focused on uh, the woman entrepreneur. And then occasionally I co-host a show called Pillars of Franchising, which is about edifying the franchise community. Absolutely. Great podcast. Uh, Pillars, I know. And um, the new one I haven't heard yet. So I'm going to tune in for some of that on Wednesdays. And uh, there's a big movement in females in franchising for sure. So I'm excited about that. I know a couple of really great ones, including you. So Yay. thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Rebecca. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. Have a great one. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of the Franchise Academy Podcast. For more info, go to our website, thefranchiseacademypodcast.com. Remember to subscribe to Tom Scarta's YouTube channel for educational videos on franchising, education, insight, and inspiration.